this session, and I want to tell you a little bit about our participants today, a little bit about um, the book, and then we'll spend most of the time um, thinking about Noreen's uh, amazing work here. So uh, this Author Meets Critics is on the book entitled The Religion of Existence, Asceticism in Philosophy from Kierkegaard to Sartre. Uh, Dr. Noreen Kawaja was, uh, is an associate professor of religious studies at Yale, and she specializes in 18th and 19th century European intellectual history, particularly on the shifting focus of religious ideas and norms in late antiquity. Her research, her, or late modernity rather, her research examines the fate of me metaphysics, the relation between critique and reform. I gotta make sure you're in the right time period, otherwise they'll, they'll worry. Mm -hmm. The nature of realism, as well as the philosophical, historical, and aesthetic features of the secular. The book that we're gonna be discussing today is her first monograph, and it is The, religious, the Religion of Existence, Asceticism in Philosophy from Kierkegaard to Sartre. It was published by Chicago in 2016. I will tell you, I was so excited to be able to get uh, Noreen here. It was our first choice uh, of book when uh, we were thinking about what book would be a good topic for an author meets critics for this particular sec session. And I know after our respondents uh, have read it, I'm sure they share my enthusiasm um, for the text. I'm gonna go ahead and, and introduce our, um, also, also our participants here. So y'all can wave when I introduce you. Um, Tony Alman, to my right here, is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Northern Michigan University. His numerous articles and forthcoming monograph uh, explore topics in Kierkegaard uh, as well as Nietzsche, and he is a research specialist as well in contemporary aesthetics. So I'm thankful for Tony to, to stepping up here and being here. Dr. Dawn Chow recently completed her dissertation, which was entitled Analogical Models of God, an Account of Religious Language at the University of Chicago. Dr. Chow currently is a lecturer in liberal arts at the Chicago of the Art Institute, that's the liberal arts at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. I can tell you from my online stalking of her that the classes that she teaches are amazing and I wish that I could take them. They're really fantastic. So the most important thing to know about Ryan Kemp, I think, is that he's an Aggie. Gig him. I am too. But yeah, so he started his undergraduate training at, uh, at Texas A&M University. Ah. Yeah, sorry. It's, it's a Texas thing. It's a, tex it's a Texas thing. <laughs> he did earn the PhD. I should so say he didn't finish his training there. He did actually complete a PhD at Notre Dame, only slightly less impressive than being an Aggie. <laughs> and he's an assistant professor of philosophy at Wheaton. He specializes in Kierkegaard and Kant and has been published in such venues as the British Journal of the History of Philosophy, HBQ, and Ray Philosophica. Dr. Sarah Shady. Um, is a good friend of mine. I'm hoping she won't tell you any embarrassing stories about me. Uh, we both, we were one of three women philosophy majors at Taylor University as undergraduates, but now she's a professor of philosophy at Bethel College. She also directs the honors program and is an affiliated faculty member in environmental studies. Her research focuses on the role of religion in politics, interfaith di dialogue, and continental philosophy. And her recent book entitled From, From Bubble to Bridge, Educating Christians for a Multi-Faith World, explores the intersection of these issues for Christian education. And I want to take a moment to introduce our videographer back there for a moment, uh, Dr. Helmut Wasser. He's a senior lecturer at Sonoma State. He also is the editor-in-chief of the journal Existens, and he's the president of the Carl Jaspers uh, Society of North America. So thanks for having us all, Helmut. Um, and now a moment uh, about the book. Those of us in the room who are familiar with the Christian existentialist tradition do not take it for granted either that Christian existentialists were prone to reject the qualifier Christian, nor that most philosophers assume that the Christian and existentialist traditions are fundamentally opposed to each other. In this beautiful book, Noreen contends that existentialism actually interacts with and appropriates philosophical and cultural ideals of Christianity, especially on the European continent. She argues that personal authenticity throughout the work of the existentialists, whether theistic or atheistic, is grounded in specifically Protestant asceticism. Meaning making is closely tied to ascetic norms and inextricable from the self's obligation to create itself despite real existential threats. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to our esteemed guests.
Thank you so much, Jill, for uh, your extremely kind words and the invitation to participate in this Author Meets Critics panel. It's extremely exciting and a great honor. Um, we're on a strict schedule, so I'll get right to it. Um, so the book uh, was in part motivated. I came to the very idea of the book because I started um, uh, thinking about a project in, um, in existentialism for my dissertation and was fascinated uh, increasingly by connections that seemed to me to form within this broad tradition across the old so-called bicameral model of existentialism, that is, in, uh, in Sartre's formulation, which was nonetheless widely recognized, um, that there is a distinction, a meaningful distinction, in fact, an essential distinction between the Christian or religious side of existentialism and another hemisphere, which was the atheistic or properly philosophical side. And those, that reputation dogged, dogs, let's say, existentialism until this day. And, I, and so the motivation uh, for the book came about because I was fascinated by uh, connections across this bicameral model that did not seem to me to be explained well by any of the kinds of theories that existed in interpreting figures um, that existed on either side of this divide or, or between them. And I'll say a few words in the, in the broadest sense about the book. It's, it's an in, it can be described as an intellectual history about the intimacy of religion and philosophy in modern Western thought at the very broadest level. If we sort of scale down a little bit about the intimacy between pietism and existentialism in particular, scaling down yet again about the intimacy between ideals of conversion and ideals of authenticity within uh, the existential uh, tradition. And as well as being an intellectual history, working at the relationships between those ideas, it's also trying to be at some, at some level a work of philosophy, that is exploring the concept of personal authenticity in a new way, reading the figures at the core of the book, Kierkegaard, Heidegger, and Jean-Paul Sartre, against themselves, with themselves, and in new connections with one another. I'll cite one line from uh, the first chapter, which I think says better than I can in another way uh, what what the, what the central aim of the book is. What I hope to show here, I write, is that the philosophical notion of personal authenticity developed by existential thinkers and the religious notion of conversion developed in Protestant theology are actually part of the same history. At the broadest level, what I mean is that they are part, both part of the history of Western asceticism. Unpacking that sentence a little bit, um, by putting them in relief against secular philosophical notions of authentic selfhood, I wanted to show the way in which Christian practices of conversion have at their core the problem of personal identity and have generated ways of thinking about that problem that were generative for existential thought. Likewise, by putting them in relief against pietistic ideals of conversion, I wanted to show the way in which philosophical accounts of subject formation in the existential tradition bear a normative structure, a way of relating ends to acts that may be better described, my claim, as ascetic rather than as ethical. More about that in a moment. Readers of this tradition, especially readers of Kierkegaard, Heidegger, and Sartre, the figures at the core of my book, have worried often about the possibility that it seems like you can be authentic without being particularly good, which means that as appealing as authenticity sounds, there may be a way in which the freedom that is supposed to come with authenticity does not coordinate neatly with ideals of ethical freedom. I introduce, I introduce the notion of asceticism in the work in part to give conceptual form to this discord or non-coordination between authenticity and, ethical, and existing ethical approaches to the self in a new way. And to understand this argument about asceticism, it's important to note that ascetic doesn't mean for me something privative. It's not synonymous with self-denial, anti-sensualism, or, um, uh, or uh, uh, deprivation, as we sometimes colloquially use the term. Taking my cue from the long tradition of ascesis, or exercise that cuts across Western philosophy and religion, ascetic in this context signifies a way of working on the self which is endless, which does not get closer and closer to its goal, but is ever to be renewed, and importantly, which is not a, a source of instrumental or intermediate value. That is, it is not a means to some other end. We'll hear a little bit more about this in some of the responses. Now, I don't want to say that the only way to tell such a story is to, to that tell such a story, that is, to examine the intimacy between religion and philosophy and existentialism is via the idea of authenticity. 
But what is compelling about authenticity as a focus for me is that it's one of those ideas um, that caught on very widely in our culture and survived the heyday of existentialism. Uh, it thrives even, you might say, in, in contemporary culture, so successful that uh, we often forget that it has its roots in the existential tradition. In other words, part of uh, a way to understand what I'm doing in the book is to see that I, I'm looking at existentialism as, as helping us understand an idea that also exists beyond it. That is, looking at the way, if I unpack this idea of, of uh, authenticity, the way in which choice, yes, understood in the particular existential sense of the term shared by these figures, that is, uh, the way in which choice acquires a normative dimension in ways of thinking about the self. We may think, okay, choice is good, obviously. Choice is better than no choice. More choices are usually considered better than fewer choices, the supermarket notwithstanding. Why do we need a philosophical argument to tell us this? But the point is not about having objective choice or choices, but on the psychological or spiritual side about experiencing the things that one does and even the things that one suffers or undergoes as participating in a movement of avowal or consent such that one can say about that thing in some deep way, yes. That yes has different features, structures, consequences in each of the thinkers I examine. I won't pause here to unpack their differences. Um, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll say uh, sort of uh, once again about, about the sort of range of the book. So I focus on, uh, especially on three figures, Soren Kierkegaard, Martin Heidegger, and Jean-Paul Sartre. But I'm also uh, dealing in, in some detail with pietist theological discourse on conversion, as well as some contemporary cultural debates about authenticity and the nature of the self. That being said, today, I think we're going to hear a lot about Kierkegaard. And I want to say one quick word about that, which is, this may not be as local as it might sound, um, because it is in the complexities of Kierkegaard's authorship that we find living together, sharing ground, so many of those otherwise star-crossed lovers that make up the vigor and breadth of the existential tradition. Though they inhabit this shared terrain of Kierkegaard's writings very differently, and we may see, as a sort of preliminary word, um, uh, based on, on the responses as, as I've read them, although uh, I understand they may be cut for time uh, in, in what we hear today, uh, we will find that that diversity in those tensions exemplified in some of the remarks uh, made today. We'll hear some, uh, I think, of the critics worrying about the deterministic elements of my interpretation and others worrying that Kierkegaard sounds too Pelagian, that, he, uh, um, uh, that his, this interpretation uh, uh, in, in some way underestimates or threatens to underestimate the, the function of grace or the, 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 the difference that the religious makes from the ethical in his thinking. And so I just wanted to flag that as a way, as a way to say, I think in Kierkegaard we can find almost all the arguments that we'll end up finding in the existential tradition uh, writ large. And uh, I, without further ado, I, I, I really look forward to the discussion today. I'd like to start by thanking the session organizers for inviting me to participate in this uh, great session on Noreen Kawaja's The Religion of Existence. Um, I've, I've actually known Noreen for many years and followed her work quite closely, and I consider uh, this book to be a, a real triumph and something that you should be incredibly proud of. Um, I, one, of the, one of the most fascinating and provocative parts of uh, Kwaja's book is her claim that Kierkegaard is uh, an ascetic thinker, uh, or more precisely that uh, Noreen's idea is that uh, for Kierkegaard, the, the process of becoming a Christian is itself an ascetic practice. Now, aestheticism is a, is a technical term uh, for Noreen. It doesn't just refer to practices of self-denial or self-mortification, as we might intuitively think. Uh, rather, on, on page 62 of the text, uh, Noreen spells out two specific conditions that an activity has to meet in order to count as ascetic in her specific sense. So, the first condition is that the activity can't be of the sort that can be completed once and for all. That somehow has to be the kind of activity that requires ceaseless renewal or, or infinite and unending striving. The second condition is that this ceaseless striving has to be an end in and of itself and not a means to some further end. It can't be some kind of intermediate good, as she often says. Now, to Noreen's great credit and the great credit of this book, she marshals a tremendous amount of evidence in favor of the thesis 
that for Kierkegaard, becoming a Christian is an ascetic practice in this precise sense. There's, there's numerous passages in which Kierkegaard describes the process of becoming a Christian as though it involves a kind of ceaseless and unending striving and certainly not the kind of thing that we're supposed to do just once a week on a Sunday for an hour. Perhaps most, uh, most tellingly here, uh, uh, Noreen cites a passage from page 225 of the Hong translation of Practice in Christianity in which Anticlimachus says that even one moment not devoted to this struggle is a moment that's wasted. In addition, there's a tremendous amount of evidence for thinking that this struggle, this infinite ceaseless struggle of becoming a Christian has got to be an, an end in itself and not a means to some further end. And we could think here, perhaps most tellingly and decisively, of passages from Upbuilding Discourses in Various Spirits, where Kierkegaard tells us that willing the good or pursuing God has to be something that you do for its own sake and not for the sake of some reward or out of fear of some kind of punishment. That's a kind of double-mindedness that we're supposed to avoid. Nevertheless, despite the fact that she marshals this tremendous evidence in favor of her thesis that Kierkegaard is an ascetic thinker, I think it's possible to push against that thesis on a number of fronts, and that's what I'd like to do. So my first challenge involves taking uh, Noreen's methodology and, and using it against her. So one of the most interesting and fascinating parts about this book is the fact that, that, that Noreen is a depth reader of all of the figures that she discusses. Uh, as, she discuss, as she says on page 20 of the introduction, she's not content just to look at the surface of any of the works that she's covering. Rather, she wants to, quote, look beyond the literal. But if that's her approach, then it seems fair play to ask whether in looking beyond the literal, she looks quite far enough. And, and in this context, I think it's, it's particularly helpful to bring to mind one of Kierkegaard's more peculiar rhetorical strategies, uh, his strategy of uh, using correctives. So in a series of journal entries from 1849 to 1854, Kierkegaard says that his account of Christian striving isn't intended literally. Rather, it's a purposeful exaggeration that he puts forward in order to correct against or push back against what he sees as a problematic tendency in the age. In particular, the, the, the tendency of Danish Lutherans to place too much emphasis on grace and not enough emphasis on striving to fulfill the law. So what Kierkegaard does is he jacks up the standard of becoming a Christian so that it's infinitely high. Not because he thinks the standard actually is infinitely high, but rather because he thinks that if he talks that way, it'll nudge us back in the right direction. The upshot is that all of those passages where Kierkegaard describes becoming a Christian as a kind of ceaseless, unending, infinite striving, all those passages aren't normative. In fact, he says in the journals where he talks about the corrective strategy that it's a mistake to take them as normative. But if that's right, then the first part of Kwaja's thesis falls away. It's not the case that Kierkegaard really thinks that becoming a, a Christian is the ceaseless striving. That's just an exaggeration. The second challenge that I want to raise involves turning to the second part of Noreen's thesis. Her claim that this infinite striving involved in becoming a Christian has to be an end in itself and not a means to some further end. To take issue with, with this part of her thesis, I want to uh, I want to call to our attention another passage from Practice in Christianity. This one comes from page 183 of the Hong translation. And on that page, Anticlimachus says that all of life is a test, or all of existence is some kind of examination. Anticlimachus' idea is that God puts struggles before us, places challenges before us, makes demands of us, because God wants to assess our level of devotion. Is it just the case that we're willing to pursue Christianity when it's easy? Or are we really willing to take God into our lives at any price or on any terms? But you might ask, well, if life is just a test or an examination, well, what's the point of that test? What's the purpose of this examination? Right, what are the stakes? What do we stand to gain if we pass the test or lose if we fail the test? In another important journal passage, one that, that Noreen herself actually cites, it's journal entry 1003 in the traditional Hong numbering, Kierkegaard gives us an answer to that question. He says that what Christianity does is it puts eternal happiness or our own eternal salvation, that's the stakes in the test of existence. And I want to read that passage or the culminating part of it at least right now. Christianity would furnish this weight 
this regulating weight by making every individual's life meaning, that whether he becomes eternally saved is decided for him in this life. Consequently, Christianity puts eternity at stake. And to the middle of all these finite goals, which merely confuse when they're supposed to be everything, Christianity introduces weight, and this weight was intended to regulate temporal life. The picture of Kierkegaard that emerges from these pa passages is of a figure who resembles Pascal. It seems as though Kierkegaard is claiming, as Pascal does, that the, the point of caring about Christian striving is that Christianity promises us an eternal happiness or an eternal salvation. But if that's the right picture of Kierkegaard, then the second part of Kowaja's thesis falls away. It's not the case that becoming a Christian is supposed to be something we do just for its own sake and not for some further sake. It's not the case that it's just an end in itself and not a means to some further end, because it is a means to some further end, namely the end of our own eternal happiness or eternal salvation. Now, despite how it may sound, I don't really mean to be suggesting that I think Noreen's central thesis that Kierkegaard is an aesthetic thinker is just false. As I said at the outset, I think there's a tremendous amount of evidence in favor of that thesis. What I'd rather mean to be doing is to call to light the fact that there's also a lot of evidence on the other side. Though, so thus, so, just as there are numerous passages in which Kierkegaard describes the process of becoming a Christian as involving a kind of infinite unending striving, so too are there passages where he seems to be saying, that's an exaggeration or a corrective. Just as there are passages where Kierkegaard seems to be saying that the struggle to become a Christian is something you're only supposed to do for its own sake and not for the sake of any kind of reward, so too there are passages, such as page 16 on the Hong translation of Postscript, where Kierkegaard or a pseudonym seems to be saying, no, the point of Christian struggle is for the sake of some kind of eternal happiness or salvation. So by my lights, Kierkegaard is a deeply contradictory thinker on the core issues that Kawaja is talking about. And so when we're discussing Kierkegaard and writing about Kierkegaard, it's important for us not to cover over one of the evidence in the name of telling a more consistent and coherent story about Kierkegaard. So in the end, that's my biggest issue with The Religion of Existence. I think it's a tremendous book. And I think if you haven't read it yet, all of you should read it. But I worry that in the name of telling us this really moving story about the place of Kierkegaard in the history of existentialism, Noreen ends up covering over some important strands of Kierkegaard's thought. Okay, I have three minutes, I'm getting to it. So, thank you, Tony. Um, first of all, the premise, you start out by saying, I treat Kierkegaard as an ascetic thinker, and that Kierkegaard's uh, notion of becoming a Christian is interpreted ascetically for me. Mm -hmm. The function of the word ascetic, as I use it, it doesn't actually appear in the Kierkegaard chapter, and I went back after I read your uh, draft and, and double-checked. It doesn't actually appear in the Kierkegaard chapter, and we can go into that perhaps in the discussion. But um, it doesn't change the fact that I'm reading his texts as bearing an ascetic structure. I would actually back off of the claim that we should interpret Kierkegaard himself as amounting to an ascetic thinker. And I don't make that claim. Um, I, with the claim that I make is that there is a dimension of normativity at the heart of Kierkegaard's works that can be best interpreted in what I describe as ascetic terms. So very quickly, um, I, I, I think, you know, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit uh, about this, uh, this aspect, uh, I think, in, in discussing Ryan's critique. But um, that dimension of normativity, uh, what I mean by that is that there, uh, is, there are certain patterns in the relationship between fact and value, between acts and ends, that cuts across his writings, that cuts across even his journal, article, journal entries. Um, published, unpublished, religious aesthetic that cuts across also, and this is the reference to, to Ryan's paper, that also cuts across the spheres of existence. So that, that, that way of relating ends to acts does not only uh, uh, characterize the ethical or religious, but also the aesthetic uh, uh, dimensions of Kierkegaard's thinking. Um, and it's in attempting to bring that structure to light that the, the work of my, I see the work of my chapter really resting. So, I don't, I don't feel attached to the thesis that Kierkegaard is an ascetic thinker if what we mean by that is that Kierkegaard amounts to an ascetic thinker. I wouldn't push that. And I also wouldn't, would make a distinction at the level of what is ascetic, like what's the object, what's the idea that I'm describing as ascetic in his thinking by describing it as this pattern of, of, of normativity to what concept is that most attached. While 
I'm exploring the notion of authenticity as, be, as, as it characterizes especially the later existential tradition um, as coming out of Kierkegaard's reflections on becoming a Christian. It's not becoming a Christian that's ascetic for me, but that structure of thinking about choice as authenticity. So I would make a distinction there, and I agree that it could be more clearly drawn in the chapter where that distinction lies. Um, but you know, it's, it was also in attempting to, to do justice to the fact that I'm putting Kierkegaard in this kind of genealogical context where he becomes the father figure for these later thinkers who have very different sets of ideas and priorities. And I'm not wanting to reduce him to that genealogy in some sense, that to make to do justice to the fact that Kierkegaard himself doesn't, doesn't actually use the term authenticity in the way in which it's developed in later existentialism, but rather he kind of creates the conceptual conditions for that idea to take shape. And so it was in describing what those conditions were, which operate at the heart of his concept of becoming a Christian and the dynamics of it, that asceticism or the ascetic applies to me. So saying all that, what I'm saying is, I don't think we have to be as worried about your concern about calling Kierkegaard an ascetic thinker and the kinds of uh, counter evidence that you marshal. I don't think we have as strong a need for that counter evidence, given the more moderate version of the claim that I'm now ar articulating. But more concretely, since you did bring that evidence in, um, I, I, I think that the, the notion of correctives as you, as you bring it in, that's a deeply disputed um, hermeneutic approach to Kierkegaard to take a journal entry, remarks in a journal entry which uh, as, as Kierkegaardians know, he, he, he wrote with uh, varying degrees of consciousness and awareness and intention for them to be published as the key to the rest of the authorship. That has, that's a contested strategy, you've written mm -hmm. about this. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I'm, uh, as an interpreter, I'm constitutionally uh, uh, um, disposed to take those kinds of hermeneutic keys less seriously than one might uh, otherwise. That's, that's the way I read and I understand that people have different interpretations of him and I'm the last person to say that there's one size fits all interpretation of Kierkegaard. Um, as for the points about the afterlife, we can get into a very long conversation about that. Mm -hmm. I see a big hand waving up at me, um, which is, uh, is perhaps the, the sure sign of the afterlife is that I've just been saved from talking about it. Um, <laughs> but um, big hand. yes. Big <laughs> So, but but there there a lot of that a lot of that debate turns on uh, how you interpret eternity, and there's a lot in my book about that, and we can yeah, get into yes. a conversation about that. And so there we go. So you you've already told us you're a little bit hesitant to this notion of correctives, snoring because of its, its place um, in journals. I think that, that that's a fair position. Um, but I'm always nervous about this notion as well because it seems like it provides a kind of carte blanche for the interpreter. Which is to say, mm -hmm. anytime you get to a passage that seems really extreme and fit with reading, that you can sort of defer to, oh, well, he's clearly exaggerating here, this, this pseudonym doesn't understand faith, or, or something like this. So, um, do you think there's a way we can get out of this, this sort of morass where we can give some credence to the idea of a corrective while still appreciating um, that applying it in principles is especially tricky? And so, maybe perhaps we should give less credence than. Totally we are. Wow, I um I, I think that the way you put it is is uh, very eloquent and apt about the carte blanche worry about uh, about that particular kind of a criterion, and uh, that's exactly what worries me as well. And it's it's especially in this case of Kierkegaard goes that idea seems to go against so much of the weight of his thinking and the efforts that he's made to defend um, the. Uh, the idea that the difficulty doesn't just stop when you want it to stop. It doesn't stop when it's inconvenient. The difficulty of becoming a Christian doesn't stop at moments when it's inconvenient. I don't think every interpretation that seeks to make use of those kinds of entries about correctives or to moderate or qualify Kierkegaard's interpretation of Christianity is guilty in some hermeneutic sense. I think it really depends on the interpretation and the consistency and coherence of what you're trying to propose. So I, I don't have a, 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 a I, I wouldn't want to imply that by my own disposition not to make use of those kinds of uh, criteria, that it's never a good idea to do so. Um, I just don't think that they solve our problems in an abstract sense. And it doesn't relieve us of the pressure of having to make a good interpretation of Kierkegaard in each case, and a good interpretation of the ideas in his works, which 
depending on how you cut them, are going to be in tension with other ideas in his works, no matter, no matter which way you cut it. So there's an immense response, hermeneutic responsibility for any reader of Kierkegaard just in approaching that corpus. And uh, that's one of the beautiful and rich and exciting things about working with him. Um, correctives can have a role in that. Uh, I'm wary when they simplify our task rather than ra rather than uh, 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 do do sort of better justice. And I'll just say one sort of thing. I think I think on the correctives note, I think it can it can uh, um, it can make most sense in. Uh, in a theological interpretation of Kierkegaard where you're trying to make his thinking about becoming a Christian work in a practical context. In an intellectual historical context where uh, the project is to understand how ideas that took shape in Kierkegaard's corpus made their way into and determined later thinking, the function of that journal art, art, uh, entry is, is Almost, qu almost questionable to me. So, so it, it depends on the context. That's what I would say. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. I've, I've written a little bit about this before, and one of the hermeneutical principles that I use to avoid the carte blanche worry that you're going to use correctives to get out of any problem that you encounter as a Kierkegaard scholar, one of the rules I use is that you have to have additional textual evidence that's kind of on the other side of the, the coin, so to speak. So if I'm going to say that ceaseless striving or perpetual choice is just a corrective and Kierkegaard is not really behind it, then I need some additional textual evidence saying where Kierkegaard says, like, oh, you don't have to do this all the time. In this case, I think I actually have such textual evidence. So there are numerous passages where Kierkegaard talks about the importance of rest, whether it's resting in God or uh, it's resting at the amusement park. That's the important passage in concluding on scientific postscript where he says that's permissible, or in Two Ages where he says it's permissible to rest in the, uh, the, the beauty of a novel. So Kawaja, Noreen to her credit, talks about these passages. And what she has to do is she is forced to downplay those passages in order to emphasize the ceaseless nature of the choice. In fact, there's this this kind of like telling line where Noreen says that anytime Kierkegaard refers to rest, it's in quotation marks, even if you don't actually see those quotation marks. Because you often do see them. So, <laughs> so but the point still stands that both of us are in, our are in a position of having to down, if we want a coherent picture of Kierkegaard, yeah. we're forced into a position of having to downplay one yeah. passage or another. Yeah. You have to downplay the corrective stuff, yeah. all right, and then and you have to downplay the rest of stuff. What do you downplay? So I think, so like the, <laughs> if you're just doing intellectual history and you're not worried about the practical problems, I think then you can embrace the kind of position I endorsed at the end here, where you say that Kierkegaard is just an inconsistent thinker and someone who's not particularly concerned with developing a coherent, a totally coherent view. Uh, um, I don't have the textual resources right now to defend this claim, but I'll say it in an outline way, which is um, that I would, I think I, my instinct is to dispute uh, or to question the difference between there being evidence that Kierkegaard thinks about rest in a literal mm -hmm. way of there being rest in Christianity and there being a lot of evidence that oh. Kierkegaard thinks about rest in, mm -hmm. in that kind of a way. I think there are passages, no question about it, but I, I tend to think that the weight of his writing is about, for all sorts of reasons that we've, that we've already talked about, um, is about emphasizing, articulating, and defending the difficulty of Christianity as a movement of spirit. You're not going to argue against that, I think. I can explain away all of that, though. <laughs> so I can, But I can, why is that the interest of explaining it away? Oh, no, I can, I can, I can say that, like, that, that emphasizing the importance of ceaseless choice is kind of strategically important for Kierkegaard because he thinks that we tend to be lazy. Right. right. And so it's to correct against their laziness that he's artificially jacking up the standard. And so there's actually a lot written on this yeah. about whether that strategy is appropriate given um, the fact that some of us don't have a tendency to be lazy but like overly self-critical. Completely. Yeah. But that's, but I wouldn't, so I mean, if, if someone wants to, to criticize Kierkegaard's premise that human beings are by and large lazy mm -hmm. and therefore his work, which dramatically emphasizes the need for rest, mm -hmm. should be qualified in its application to our pursuit of the ideals of Christianity of becoming a Christian, that's fine. But I'm not question without questioning the premise, the coherence of that um, uh, of his writings, I think, bends toward the emphasis on dif difficulty. That was one one bit of it, and and I think uh, the question about literal and non-literal. You're right to put pressure on this. You're right, absolutely, to emphasize there being tensions in his work. 
Um, I don't want to uh, be uh, considered or have the work be considered as something that denies uh, the op the alternate uh, possibilities around the argument that that I'm that I'm taking. I don't emphasize them, mm -hmm. but I'm not denying that they exist or that they uh, mm -hmm. dominate in certain conversations, um, uh, interpretations of his of, of his work. But once one once one engages in a non literal quote unquote mm -hmm. reading of Kierkegaard, one has the self understanding of not doing a literal reading. Mm -hmm. Then one is then responsible for saying what's the difference between a literal and a non-literal reading, mm -hmm. and I think there are multiple ways of slicing, um, multiple ways of slicing that, and uh, especially thinking about um, about about the journal using the word literal, right? In that in that moment, uh, it's it's very interesting. So that's all to the uh, to the to the point that I agree with you that there are important tensions there. And um, and I sort of took them as my starting point. I assumed that they exist in the literature, in the background, and around some of these concepts. My point was not to say that only one of these is valid, but one set, one dominant strain and, and cast in those um, readings of Kierkegaard's work on rest best explains and can be understood to um, uh, participate in the kind of dynamic I'm working at. So it was a selective focus, not because I want to say that no other reading is possible, but because it served the purposes of the argument, let's say. So I'm very grateful to have been asked to speak here. Um, I'm very grateful to Noreen for writing this lovely and illuminating book. Um, and it's, it's an honor um, to, to be commenting on it. Um, like Tony, I'm, I'm going to be focusing specifically on the interpretation of Kierkegaard presented in the book. Um, the second chapter of, of the book presents a novel interpretation of Kierkegaard's concepts of despair, sin, and repentance. And drawing on interpretations of Kierkegaard posed by later existentialist thinkers like Heidegger, Kawaja interprets these concepts having to do with alienation and the struggle to overcome it. Uh, and this reading of Kierkegaard is unquestionably an illuminating one and an appealing one. Um, but I'm not yet convinced that it's an accurate one. So I, I must confess that when I began to try to argue against this reading of Kierkegaard, I found it much more difficult than I had anticipated. I kept latching onto passages and thinking, ah, I've got her now. She can't possibly account for this, only to soon realize that she could account for this. Um, a lesser commenter would have been discouraged. Uh, but I, in what follows, I'm going to present one argument against her interpretation. And I look forward to hearing what she has to say about it and possibly to hearing her demolish my argument as she has, albeit unknowingly, demolished so many of my prior attempts. Uh, so I'll begin with a brief overview of Kavich's interpretation as I understand it. So on the account, one of Kierkegaard's major concerns is to provide a solution to alienation, to the fact that each person finds herself in a world she did not create, governed by conditions and laws she did not choose. Kierkegaard's solution to alienation on this account is appropriation of the givens of existence, taking those things one did not choose and choosing them, freely deciding to make them one's own and taking responsibility for them. However, appropriation has its limits. Uh, uh, as she puts it, the self's alienation goes all the way down and cannot be overcome by mere appropriation of individual givens. This radical alienation is, is what Kavaja takes Kierkegaard to mean by despair. Now, Kierkegaard describes sin as despair before God, sin viewed in light of its being before God. And so if sin is a, or if, sorry, if despair is alienation and sin is just despair before God, then sin is also fundamentally alienation. However, sin is alienation interpreted by the subject in a particular way. What distinguishes sin from mere despair, i.e. mere alienation, is that one interprets it as sin, uh, as something that makes one a sinner. So my core objection to this reading is that Kierkegaard repeatedly emphasizes that sin, to be sin at all, must be the sinner's own fault. It must be something the sinner has freely chosen. Um, this point is emphasized especially in the concept of anxiety, which rejects the doctrine that human beings inherit sin from Adam, um, instead insisting that each person makes the qualitative leap from innocence into sin, uh, just as Adam did by their own choice. And what's true of sin is also true of the term guilt, a word that is in most contexts roughly interchangeable with sin. One only becomes guilty for Kierkegaard by one's own free choice. But while it's essential that sin is always the sinner's own fault and that guilt is always the guilty person's own fault, I don't think this aspect of Kierkegaard's view can be satisfactorily accounted for within Kawaja's interpretation. 
So if we consider only the equation of sin with alienation, then it's not clear there's any problem. It would be too facile to say that alienation is something we can just overcome by force of will, um, but radical alienation has at least something to do with the activity of our will, churning away in its attempt to appropriate the givens of existence. And so this seems like enough to justify describing alienation as something we've done to ourselves, rather than something that merely happened to us. But the equation of sin with alienation is not the only role that the concept of sin plays in this interpretation of Kierkegaard. Um, on Coverage's interpretation, coming to interpret oneself as a sinner involves not merely recognizing one's alienation, but also recognizing the givens of one's existence as a debt for which one is responsible. Furthermore, the one who recognizes herself as a sinner interprets those debts as making her guilty. Uh, and this seems to entail that those things one is guilty of or guilty over are precisely those things which are given, the givens of existence, uh, and therefore are precisely the things one did not choose. Uh, but as I've already noted, Kierkegaard rejects the idea that one could be guilty of something that merely happened to one that you didn't choose. So there seems to me to be two approaches one could take to resolve this interpretive puzzle. One approach would be to take the sinner's interpretation of herself, herself as guilty to be a sort of fictive interpretation on which one is meant to act as if these unchosen things were one's own choice, and thus as if they rendered one guilty, even though they were not actually one's own choice, and thus did not actually render one guilty. In the interest of time, I'm going to set that possibility aside and note merely that I don't think that account would be compatible with Kierkegaard's views. The other approach to solving the interpretive puzzle, and this is the one that Noreen in fact takes, unless I have misunderstood her on this point, is to collapse the distinction between sin consciousness and sin, uh, and likewise between guilt consciousness and guilt. So on the interpretation I would favor of Kierkegaard's concepts of sin and guilt, we can draw a clear distinction between the choice to sin, and therefore to become guilty, and the choice to acknowledge oneself as a sinner, uh, and acknowledge oneself as a guilty person. And on this, what I think is a sort of common sense view, sin and consciousness of sin are distinct things which pick, pick out distinct choices, distinct moments in the life of an individual. Uh, by contrast, um, Kabata argues that the experiential basis of an individual's own sin consciousness, this is a quote, uh, the experiential basis of an individual's own sin consciousness is sin's only point of departure. For all human beings, it is with the subjective consciousness of sin that the history of sin begins. So it's not that one just has been sinning all along and then at some point perhaps comes to recognize that truth. Um, instead, the view is that if one comes to recognize oneself as a sinner, then it follows that one has been sinning all along. But those previous things only become sins once one recognizes oneself as a sinner. So the distinction between sin and sin consciousness collapses. There is no such thing as sin independently of acknowledgement of oneself as being in sin. So collapsing the distinction between sin and sin consciousness does seem to resolve the interpretive problem that I was highlighting. For Kierkegaard, guilt and sin must necessarily be the product of free choice. The problem was that if that by virtue of which one is guilty or is a sinner is the givens of existence, that seems to entail that guilt and sin are not the product of free choice. But if one becomes a sinner only when one chooses to understand oneself as a sinner and becomes guilty only when one chooses to understand oneself as guilty, that, that allows us to harmonize the claim that it's the givens of existence over which one is guilty with Kierkegaard's insistence that guilt and sin are always things one chooses. Uh, so that's a very tidy solution um, and an appealing solution, but I don't think it fits well with what Kierkegaard says about sin and guilt. It is certainly true that Kierkegaard deliberately equivocates in his usage of the term sin and guilt, as he does with so many other terms. Uh, and it's certainly true that he does in some places suggest the kind of collapse between sin and sin consciousness that Noreen highlights. Specifically, in Sickness Unto Death, Anticlimachus says that those who are utterly lacking in sin consciousness are, by virtue of that fact, barely even sinners. And that does make sense, because Anticlimachus defines sin as disobedience to God. And to be disobedient, one must first be conscious of the command one disobeys. Um, and so if many of us never even get to the point of consciously doing anything, uh, because we live thoughtless, spiritless, unreflective lives, 
We therefore, in a sense, aren't sinners. But Anticlimachus goes on to say that, of course, in another <coughs> sense, we are sinners. Such people are sinners. Because even the spiritless person is to blame for his own spiritlessness. His spiritlessness is his own fault and traces back to his own will. And thus he says that that very spiritlessness is itself a form of disobedience. And so it seems to me that Kierkegaard really does distinguish between sin and sin consciousness because he asserts that the person who passes his entire life lacking in any sin consciousness is nonetheless the whole time a sinner. So I don't think the evidence is in favor of the view that Kierkegaard collapses this, the distinction between sin and sin consciousness. And if we reject that collapse, I don't see a way to harmonize uh, Kawaja's interpretation of Kierkegaard's concept of sin with Kierkegaard's insistence that sin is something one freely chooses. Um, but having, having laid out that argument, I have to say um, that the account um, that we get in this book of Kierkegaard is a valuable one in its own, its own right. Um, on this view, rather than bemoaning my absolute dependence on conditions external to my will, uh, Kierkegaard argues instead that I can choose to relate to the givens of my existence as a gift for which I'm infinitely indebted. Uh, and this, I think, is, is a beautiful account and a compelling account. And so even if I'm right that this is a reinterpretation of Kierkegaard rather than a strictly accurate interpretation, it's a reinterpretation we're much richer for having. Okay, so thank you for that uh, final remark. I'm going to try to say that it is, in fact, an accurate interpretation of Kierkegaard, but we're, here we go. Okay, so there are some aspects of, um, of, your, uh, of your paper that I'm going to ask you to clarify. So um, uh, well, saying that in advance, I want to sort of try to first see if I've got this right and ask you this question. If I've understood it right, part just in, put it in the most crude terms, part of your worry is Kierkegaard ends up looking too deterministic in his view of sin. That is, it's, sin is, a par, is something we are free to choose. I don't, uh, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but, I, I, uh, but, but, but the worry, I, th I think you were using alienation as um, an attempt to signify the way in which something given or determined or um, factical, if you want to spin forward into later existential terms, um, features in Kierkegaard's thinking about the cultivation of the self. Alienation is a word for that. I emphasize that in the first part of the Kierkegaard chapter because part of what I'm doing there is trying to show how Kierkegaard inherits uh, a kind of Hegelian grammar for thinking about uh, the psyche and the spirit and does things with that grammar that end up looking more like existential notions of givenness and facticity than uh, Hegel himself might. So, so the function of alienation as a term to hold on to determinism has a place sort of in the first half of the, of the Kierkegaard chapter. In, if you look at the other passages you quote on sin in, in, the, in, 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 in the later part of the chapter, but also in the more explicit discussion of the concept of anxiety, which we're going to, uh, I think, get in a little discussion about now, um, uh, the, the emphasis is, 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 is more on givenness. And um, I think that, uh, it, just to quote you, so, sin is something necessarily freely chosen, something one freely chooses, fr chooses not something one merely inherits. That's the, that's the basic claim of your, uh, of your critique and your, and your uh, worry about my reading. I don't, I don't agree with that interpretation. The evidence that you use to sort of bring it, um, uh, to give it, give it some weight is also evidence that I use, right? Where, so we're, we're sort of reading the same passage in the concept of anxiety where Kierkegaard is, or um, uh, uh, Hafninsis is, is writing about uh, the concept of hereditary sin and pushing back against the concept of hereditary, right? And to say that sin is not hereditary, here's my, here's my claim which I agree he does, does not necessarily mean that one is free to choose to sin. And it's the logic of givenness, I think, that best explains that distinction, that is, not being inherited from my parents, from my ancestors, from the race as a whole of human beings, does not necessarily mean that uh, uh, sin is, a, uh, is the object of my choice. And here's, a, here's a, another distinction I want to make. It does sin being a part of freedom. Sometimes you say it's a part of the will or it's a part of freedom or it's something, uh, an aspect of choice. I would agree with that. 
I would agree that sin is a feature of freedom, but that that freedom itself is not something we've chosen. And that circle, where freedom and givenness are not clearly distinguishable from one another in a separate, stable way, but are co-implicated in existence, I think is at the core of Kierkegaard's anthropology, the co-implication of freedom and givenness. And what I think sin does, interestingly, and so in the passage where you quote about sin uh, allows us to take responsibility for the given, I realized in writing about Kierkegaard's thinking about sin that I started to understand what sin as a special kind of category, the consciousness of sin that he emphasizes. And I don't know if I'll have time to go into to, to, to that. I don't, just, I don't think I collapse the distinction. I would say sin consciousness is presupposed by sin. And I talk a lot about the logic of presupposition in that chapter. But it doesn't nece necessarily mean to say that sin consciousness is pre presupposed by sinning to say that the distinction has collapsed. So I would sort of put my response in that, in that zone. But so what I realized in interpreting Kierkegaard is thinking about um, uh, this notion of sin and authenticity, it clarified to me one of the beautiful and fascinating aspects of sin qua fallenness, so not sin come, uh, not sin as a, as a, uh, as a sin, right, but sinfulness. Um, it's a category that allows us or names our responsibility for something we did not do. That's what's scary about sin. That's what's exciting about sin. It, it announces an eccentric form of responsibility where I am responsible for something that is not purely me, does not purely coincide with something I've done, which doesn't mean even though that responsibility implies freedom, and I agree with you there, it doesn't mean that I've chosen that freedom or that I'm free not to have that freedom. And so that's where I would say that givenness sneaks back in to the freedom of sin, and freedom sneaks into the givenness. And I think that's what's so interesting about Kierkegaard. So I would, I would sort of just cast my response in that, in that, in that direction and, and see what you have to say about that. When I read the concept of anxiety, it seems to me like he is repeating over and over again that uh, you don't become a sinner except by sinning and that you can't sin unless you are first innocent and then you leapt into the sin. Um, and, and I mean, to, to me, it just looks really strongly like he's, he's, he's rejecting the idea of hereditary sin, um, which is a traditional doctrine precisely because it, it's opposed to his his conception on which, no, it's something that you did if, if you'd merely been, if, if it was something that merely happened to you because you're human um, and not by virtue of your choice, then it wouldn't be sin. Um, but you know, you have all, you have the pieces of evidence I tried to give um, uh, to prove that, and I'm not sure I have any more. Um, uh, I mean, one, one place where, where I think we do disagree is, is you know, there's this, this, odd, this odd passage where he says that sin presupposes itself. Yeah. And I have a, a completely different reading of it than you do. Um, but, but then I, I'm not, you know, just as your reading doesn't convince me, I'm sure my reading doesn't convince you. So, I, so yes, I, I, I do at this point find it hard to know what to say, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> I mean, I, I can I. I mean, I invite anyone to, to to join in on this on this question. But I think the question about the relation between sin and freedom is an open question that most readers of Kierkegaard res wrestle with. This is an occasion for you, maybe, to expand some of the theoretical apparatus that allows you to hold the position that you do. So, as I understand it, your view is that for Kierkegaard, we can be guilty for things that we didn't choose, or responsible for things that we ourselves didn't. Um, choose and so then I guess I want to know well what concept of guilt and what concept of, of responsibility is operative for you here like what do you think Kierkegaard means by guilt then mm -hmm. because it seems like it has to depart from our traditional notion our common sense notions of guilt and responsibility they may be somehow tradition connected to some tradition but I guess I just want you to expand on that like yeah. what is guilt and responsibility for Kierkegaard on your account. This does this gets us into the question of responsibility. It also gets us into the question of consciousness. So I think one of the dramatic and mysterious features of the sickness unto death is the way that consciousness in in developing a notion of sin and the relationship between sin and despair, the way that the concept of consciousness features heavily in that account. There's a dramatic presence to the notion of consciousness. The more consciousness, the more sin. That's a famous line, right? From the transition from the first to the second half. 
And sin consciousness, what does explicitly understand, what's the difference between doing something wrong, regretting it, or simply not, do not, not even, we don't even have to start from that position, simply going about one's business in one's daily life and understanding that daily finitude, failure, half-realized ideals, half-realized uh, sort of uh, ethical obligations. What's the difference between doing that and regretting it and doing that and, and understanding those failures as sinful? On my reading of Kierkegaard, it's the interpretation of oneself as a sinner, the dogmatic category of sin, which must be taught at some point, um, and that's the function of revelation for him, um, it's the dogmatic category of sin that allows one to have that shift in, in, in consciousness or relationship to one's faults or flaws. So on that understanding, consciousness is um, something that uh, transforms one's relationship to oneself and creates a different set of conditions for understanding the wrongs one is doing, the rights one is doing, what their consequences are, what their implications are. On the question of uh, sin and guilt in that relationship, because one can be guilty before understanding that guilt as sinful, right? And it's, consciousness, it's the consciousness of oneself as a sinner that he will insist as, that distinguishes the guilty from the sinful. Um, I don't think that uh, Kierkegaard is saying we can be guilty of things we didn't do in the sense that I am guilty of um, someone else's crime. I think what he's saying is that the very um, basis of our freedom and our will is something that outstrips the performance of the will itself in the, in the sickness unto death. So the will tries to lay hold, hold of itself. It's castles in the sand, right? All those dramatic moments where you're trying to catch up with your own foundation, trying to give yourself a ground, stand on the basis of your own decision, and you fail, you crash down, you fall. You can understand that as a failure, as a guilt, as a flaw in your own endeavor. But there's nothing you can do on, on Kierkegaard's version of that anthropology to get out of that predicament. The structure of your will is trying to master itself constantly, whether you're pursuing it in the maximum aesthetic way of, of the sort of aesthetic virtuoso of despair or not. Um, and it's failing to do so. And it's that asymmetry or eccentricity of responsibility, that nonetheless you're answerable for that failure that you can't choose to be opt to, you can't opt out of, that structure of will. And so it's, it's on that front that I think the uh, way in which sin expresses a responsibility for something that is not chosen is important to his conception of human uh, 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 subjectivity, not in the sense that I'm you know, guilty for someone else's uh, deeds or misunderstanding or the history of human beings necessarily, although I think you could extend versions in that direction provocatively. That's not my interest. Um, it's really about the structure of, uh, uh, of willing that outstrips itself, let's put it that way. And that's givenness for me, not alienation. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, good to be with you. It was uh, quite an honor to be invited, largely because this is such a, a wonderful book. Um, a bit of a confession to begin with. I had a very uncomfortable experience in the, I think as early as the first chapter of this book, where I realized I could never write something this beautiful and insightful, and uh, that the book had already been, I'd sort of been scooped already, um, written the book that I'd, that I'd like to write someday. Um, so it's been done. I'm going to sign it my name onto it. Tony, Tony's Tony point is, 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 is there is a lot left out, so yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, I'm interested in the concept of conversion, um, especially coming out of the sort of um, debates in, in Kant and German idealism. Um, but as those debates take shape there, they're often about um, dispositions. So how someone, so in Kant's religion book, you could go from being someone with a bad fundamental maxim to a good fundamental maxim. And so there's this other notion of conversion that's on the table um, in a tradition that Kierkegaard is coming out of um, and this book is ostensibly about conversion, so I'd like to hear more about this, this other notion of, of conversion. So my, my comments are going to focus there today. And I think the things I'm going to say or ask about Kierkegaard could just as easily be applied to, to Heidegger or Sartre. Um, but because he has these wonderful spheres, right, which could be interpreted as kind of dispositions of existence, 
I'm going to stick with him um, uh, as, as has been our habit so far. So here we go. Um, the most surprising aspect of Kawaja's wide-ranging and impressive treatment of Kierkegaard is the almost complete absence of any explicit analysis of Kierkegaard's so-called spheres or stages. Some of us will think that this is one of the, the great things about her book, that we finally got past the spheres or stages, um, but here I am bringing us back to it. Um, if we look at another influential pietist, um, Immanuel Kant, we see, as I just mentioned, that there is this element or this emphasis on an entirely different notion of conversion. And I wanted to see how that um, is present in this book, if you see it is present, and, and what to make of it. So I want to begin with this example from the book Repetition that Noreen uh, focuses on as a key example of alienation. There's a young man, uh, he's fallen in love, uh, he, he senses that he's, he's guilty before this other person. There's an experience in which this love is something that has befallen him as opposed to something that he sort of chose for himself. Um, so it becomes a sort of perfect example of alienation on Kawaja's account because it's something you don't have respons responsibility for and there's an invitation to sort of affirm it and take responsibility. But on, on my reading of what's going on there, what's really striking is not just that something has befallen the young man in repetition, but there's a change in sort of the valence or notion of, of love here, not just from, from something like erotic love to something we might describe as ethical love. And so there's a hint that an esteet, once he or she has come to, for instance, experience guilt, that she is in a radically sort of different sphere. She's no longer in the aesthetic sphere, she's in the ethical sphere. So there's this quote that, that Noreen um, brings out in the book, I'll, I'll quote it here. How did I get involved in this big enterprise called actuality? Guilt, what does it mean? How did it happen that I became guilty? So the mi most disconcerting aspect of this whole affair for the young man is not the experience of love per se, but the experience of being guilty before someone you love. The young man's longing for what he calls a repetition seems to me to be a longing to go back to his pre-ethical existence, to unconvert, so to speak. Now, Kawaja thinks that the movement the young man needs to make is one of appropri appropriation. He needs to own his guilt. Kawaja also, also thinks that Judge William, so the ethical persona in, in either or, is already aware of this, and she quotes the following passage as evidence. The judge writes, the divine in a person lies in this, that he himself, if he so chooses, can give this history continuity, because it gains that not when it is a summary of what has taken place or what has happened to me, but only when it's my personal deed in such a way that even that which has happened to me is transformed and transferred from necessity to freedom. So while this passage rehearses something like the basic move that Kawaja will go on to associate with existential conversion, a movement from resolve where a person takes responsibility uh, for her past, she's less explicit about the basic differences between the way in which the judge conceives of this act of resolution and the way the person of religious faith conceives of it. This question of the differences between the two stages becomes an especially important quest question when we acknowledge, as philosophical fragments invites us to, that faith is something that is given, not chosen. It's a condition that we receive. This is significant because while it may be possible for someone to adopt the right attitude about his or her life, the ability to see that attitude is the right one um, may not be available to them. Where the vision is not possible, say for someone like Judge William, can there still be a non-religious form of authenticity or is authenticity only available to the person of faith? So the absence of choice at this juncture between ethics and faith does not, of course, prevent Kierkegaard from thinking that we ought to be Christians nonetheless. So ought might not imply he can. Um, but this ought seems only retrospectively appropriate, right? A person of faith may come to see her faith existence as one of sinful defiance, when really, as experienced from the perspective of the pre-conversion self, this issue is one of mere ignorance. If we really think that there's an important overlap in the theories of authenticity developed by each of our three thinkers, and that Heidegger refuses to char characterize his account of authenticity as having normative implications, while Sartre gets into trouble when he starts to sort of breathe in normative implications from his account of authentic authenticity, excuse me, um, might there be a kind of basic problem in Kierkegaard's account too, that the art of Christianity is not going to be importantly available to most of his audience? 
So finally and relatedly, um, I would like to hear Kawaja say more about the way in which um, virtue might have a role in this account. So can someone get closer to this, this sort of attitude of authenticity that she's so concerned with, such that uh, she doesn't have to sort of start from zero all over again? Is it right to think about Kierkegaard's fears of existence as being sort of placeholders in that movement? Thank you. Lots of interesting questions. Okay. So if I understand, some, I'm going to try to restate some of the pieces in the mm -hmm. chain of your, in, in your critique to, to, to reconstitute them and see if I've got it right. So you open with a, 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 a sort of remark about, which you know, I'm, I was extremely excited to read that, because no one yet has, has asked why I don't use the, la the language of the stages, which Good. you would think would be a, an Im immediate question, but, uh, uh, but I suppose I disguised it well enough. I don't know. Um, yes, I don't use the language of the stages, and I, I think just sort of a, a, word, a quick word about why in particular, and you're right, in an, in, a, in, a, in an account that's so focused on Kierkegaard's thinking about conversion, that would seem to be a, a useful, relevant term, partly because it has so dominated scholarship for so long and has become a, and, it, and yet, and so it seems familiar, the aesthetic sphere, the ethical stage, they're not, they're not technical terms in the way um, that we might think of philosophical technical terms being really alienating, they reference everyday words, but they are jargony in a sense. And yeah. I think that, that what he's describing can be explained more simply than those words often in shorthand tend to, tend to invoke. And so I, I have a kind of constitutional resistance to that terminology. Um, and just specifically, I, I think I could have, and, my, and maybe there would have, there, there's an argument for this, made a comment about not using those terms and what the work of conversion is doing. But the Kierkegaard chapter, um, begins with a, with a funny sentence. It says, uh, somewhere along the way, I'm paraphrasing loosely, somewhere along the way, Kierkegaard, for whatever reason, decided not to use the word conversion. So part, what, what, what the, the reason I wanted to start with that sentence is to dramatize the fact that I think there's an idea or a concept or a structure to his thinking that transects uh, his different kinds of writing, his religious writing, his ethical writing, his aesthetic writing that transects the spheres. You could think, for example, you, you mentioned the, 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 the idea of taking, I'll, I'll get back to this. The, no, I'll, I'll, come back, I'll come back to it, sorry. But, um, uh, okay. Um, uh, uh, so, um, so it transects uh, a lot, the different kinds of his authorship. And to try to, to try to bring a bit of curiosity to the fact that he doesn't, it's curious, it's weird that he doesn't use the word conversion in a way, given how wrapped up his thinking is in that tradition of thinking. And so the, the kind of shadow treatment to the language of the spheres was in part rhetorical about wanting to bring the dramatic absence of conversion language, given it's, what, what I'm arguing for is its presence in his authorship. Um, but I think I take your point about the specific relevance of the transition between the ethical and the religious on the on the uh, on the question of adopting a new normative stance towards one's life, being in a, a, a place where the relevance of what he's trying to do, the work he's trying to do with the stages, might come back around. Um, I'll say I think, and this is where my little note comes in. Um, I was very tempted and encouraged by your Kant comparison. That explained yeah. something to me about the repetition passage that I hadn't seen before, that question of guilty. I hadn't, hadn't focused on that. Um, and I take that point. Um, I also think, though, it can't fully account for the dynamic I'm accounting for in Kierkegaard's thinking of conversion, that adopting a new norm about one's life, because it, it also characterizes this dynamic of, of, uh, of aesthetic training or conversion, which I'm describing, characterizes the aesthetic, what he calls the aesthetic sphere. So if you look at, for example, I would say the seducer, Johannes, is um, perhaps uh, the aesthetic sphere taken to its aesthetic consequence, yeah. right? And so he can't be said to be adopting a new norm in the sense of an ethical norm, right? unless there's a mixture there and there's an ambiguity, which I'm also open to. But so I, I think that there, there's important work that that question about Kantian, um, uh, a Kantian language of adopting a norm could yeah. do in Kierkegaard's authorship. Um, I'm not sure yet, because I've just started thinking about it, um, how that might reorder, if it, if it would reorder, the way the path through Kierkegaard's thinking about conversion that, that I'm laying out there. Um, so, uh, just on, on uh, then, then the just two other sorts of sets of questions. 
uh, one sort of smaller and one much broader that you pose at the end. Um, one is about uh, where this vision of not of is not possible. Can there be a non-religious form of authenticity, or is an authenticity only possible to the person of faith? I go back to something that uh, that came out in 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 uh, in the, the the discussion around um, around Tony's critique, which is. I'm sensitive to the fact that Kierkegaard doesn't use the term authenticity. So there's something odd about stabilizing that moment of cultivation in Kierkegaard's thinking and trying to sort of adopt it if you're not also adding a later existential thinking about authenticity to the picture. People have done it. People like Dreyfus have done it. Uh, Bert Dreyfus have done that kind of an argument. I, I'm not personally uh, drawn to that kind of an art. I think it perverts lots of elements of his thinking and reorders them in ways that I, I think is uh, uh, is distorting. Um, but so I wouldn't I wouldn't be for the idea that someone should turn to Kierkegaard's authorship if you want a version of authenticity that doesn't go on in that direction. Then you should go to read Sartre. Then you should go to read Kier Heidegger, right? So I, I would kind of I would kind of put my put my response to your question in that way. And then the final remark about virtue, um, I like your suggestion. I think that you, you posed uh, what seems to me the best suggestion possible uh, in, in response to your own question about the stages being a possible way in which a shorthand or a, a gesture at thinking about progress might, um, might, be, might be considered or construed. Um, that's a reconstruction of Kierkegaard's thinking. It would probably go back to Tony's point and bring some tension with my insistence that there is no asymptotic asymptotic process progress to that ideal. But uh, I think that's an argument that, that could be made in in, in connection there um, about uh, and the way you frame it is is uh, is is about existentialism writ large. I'll say you know the idea of virtue ethics or or character dispositions is anathema to Sartre. He yeah. will absolutely argue against that to the to the uh, until the cows come home. Uh, pigs fly, which one? I don't know. Um, they're, sorry, yeah. Uh, so Sartre will argue uh, directly against that. Heidegger just avoids those notion of agency yeah. altogether, so it's like a non-starter in thinking about his work. I think Kierkegaard is the only place where you can get traction. People have made, lot, there, there has been great uh, sort of work done on virtue ethics in Kierkegaard, Ed Mooney, John Davenport. Um, so I think it's a possible argument to be made. They don't make it in the way that you're, in the way that I think that you propose, but it's compatible. And so, yeah, I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't say, say no on that score. Well, just as part of what came up a moment ago, and as this pertains to the unity of your project, I'd like to hear you say more about the notion of authenticity. And if there isn't the term authenticity in Kierkegaard, there's certainly something very near to it in distinctiveness. And, you know, love is the divine gift by virtue of which we come to have distinctiveness, each of us, or one's ownedness, depending on how you want to translate that. Um, that's clearly, to me, the parallel term that would go alongside a notion of authenticity in uh, Heidegger or Sartre. Each of them nuance differently, though. So, I mean, if you don't use that term in Kierkegaard, then how do you, in a reconstruction, find something like authenticity, maybe that you prefer to call conversion in Kierkegaard, um, as a basis for developing how this ideal comes to differ in these later existential thinkers? Yeah, so I, I agree with you that I, I, I think uh, um, Kierkegaard's work does so much, enormous amounts of conceptual work toward developing what can look like a theory of authenticity, even though he doesn't name it as such. Um, and that's, in fact, the premise. If, 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 if I didn't think that, I couldn't have written him uh, a book with him as the uh, sort of first locus of thinking about a genealogy of authenticity. Um, but. Uh, uh, I like your language of distinctiveness and thinking about it as uh, uh, in that in those terms. In in the chapter uh, where I'm I'm talking about Kierkegaard, I use multiple different sets of terms that he uses, and I think it's an idea that pervades his authorship in lots of different forms. Um, one's ownedness is is certainly uh, being one's own, being one's own, or having one's own. The role that interest plays in his thinking, that investment in. Um, and so distinctness is one aspect, but the love part is really essential to it because it's about the activity and the movement and the dynamic aspect of that distinctiveness. It's not a passive kind of distinctiveness, like I'm objectively distinct from Ryan, is 
objectively distinct from um, from uh, from from Sarah, um, uh, but but a movement of spirit, right? And and so I, I, I agree with you that that he um, that he uses those terms. My my point about him not using the term authenticity in the context of responding to Ryan's uh, question was only that um, the worry that he has about if someone is not oriented toward faith in the way that Kierkegaard's authorship largely is. Um, it's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't start making an explanation of how you could use his thinking about authenticity to that end. I would rather redirect that person to someone like Heidegger or Sartre who develops closely related and also in deep influence, being influenced by Kierkegaard notions of authenticity without that directedness. So, I w yeah, and I, that's, that's, that was the context in which I was making that claim about authenticity not being a concept of his, certainly not to say that he doesn't, uh, in, in, you know, as much as anyone, he couldn't, I think he, as much as anyone could be called this, and there are always, you know, there's always a before and, and a before the before, but the inventor of, of existential authenticity as we know it, so, yeah. So it sounds like there, that we might not want to use the term. There might be something like authenticity for each of the stages. You talked yeah. about uh, Johannes the seducer being this sort of end of um, yeah. the aesthetic stage, maybe being an authentic version of it. But I am still troubled by this, and I think it's, it's, it's not a, a new accusation against the existentialists, that insofar as they lack an account of virtue, they lack something very important indeed. And I think I identify myself as someone who's inclined to um, want to defend the existentialist Maybe I, I can assume safely that, that you would find yourself in that camp as well. Maybe not. Um, but do you think that that's, that's a worthy accusation against the existentialists, that for someone like Sartre, maybe for, for Kierkegaard as well, there just is no account of virtue? Wait, OK. Yeah, that's, that was the thrust of your question. Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't write this book because I don't like existentialism. So when I say I don't want to defend the existentialist, I don't mean that. I mean, uh, I don't think existentialism or mm, uh, any philosophical tradition can do all things. And so def if defending it means um, taking the position that um, this, the tradition must account for a certain objection or a certain worry in order to function, I would rather stay with what I take to be um, the thrust of a lot of its thinking, and I'm not including Kierkegaard here, I'm really including Heidegger yeah. and Sartre, um, and, and perhaps Camus also. Um, uh, um, and I wouldn't include either Buber or Jasper, who, who we're going to talk about in just a moment. <laughs> Um, yeah. In this point, and I think this this the question about the ethical makes a perfect transition to what we're what we're about to discuss in a moment. Um, but uh, so I wouldn't defend if, if if defending it means trying to uh, make it possible for a virtue ethicist to be at home in Sartre. I think that's I wouldn't make that claim. I would say, you know, this is th there there is no there's no there's no shared ground between those positions. I would say if if that's if a notion of agency depends on that kind of disposition or that kind uh, of a notion of progress or or advancement that in in moral efforts in moral uh, striving, um, then I think Sartre's not the place to look for it. It's a distinct notion of freedom and it's designed to do different things. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there we have yeah. yeah. Well, Noreen gave a bit of foreshadowing that I'm about to switch the train to a different set of tracks um, and focus on um, uh, some musings I have about the connection of this fantastic book to the work of Buber and Jaspers. So um, I have the privilege of being a scholar of Buber who works at a university that's deeply rooted in the pietist tradition. And so reading this book was fabulous because it's keeping a, a conversation within the existentialist tradition going in new and innovative and exciting ways. And it's doing it against the background of another um, part of intellectual history that I, I navigate quite a bit. Um, so I titled my remarks, The Religion of Coexistence, A Path Through Buber and Jaspers, uh, because while I'm largely supportive of Quadra's thesis, um, I do think that her study has been limited by tracing only one aspect of pietism, conversion, through only one set of existentialists, uh, Kierkegaard, Heidegger, and Sartre. And so in these comments, 
I suggest that um, existentialism has also been dramatically impacted by pietism's emphasis on bearing witness to one's conversion through a never-ending responsibility to love one's neighbor. And the existentialist tradition has never focused solely on personal authenticity. It also contains impor important work on authentic being with others. And so in order to begin to give shape to this possible extension, and that's how I see it more than a critique is an extension of Kawaja's project, we'll see if she agrees, I focus on the work of Buber and Jaspers because both stress the importance of mutuality in the ongoing labor of authenticity. Um, so I'll, I'll start by um, digging into a little bit more into the pietist intellectual heritage to bring this notion of commitment of, of, to love of neighbor to the foreground with the attempt that what I'm trying to advocate is that Quadra's important insights about the ongoing uh, conversation between religion and philosophy that characterizes the meta themes of this book can be uh, expanded and strengthened by recognizing the theme of authentic coexistence as an important thread in the existentialist tradition. Um, so the, an early pietist, Philip Jacob Spainer, in his Pia Desideria, identified six pious wishes that uh, aimed at a renewal of Christian life and faith. And as an extension of pietism's strong emphasis on self-conscious conversion and spiritual experience, Spainer's pious wishes focus on um, Christian life and practice. As Spainer asserts, it's by no means enough to have knowledge of the Christian faith, for Christianity consists rather of practice. If we can therefore awaken a fervent love among our Christians, first toward one another and then toward all men, and put this love into practice, practically all that we desire will be accomplished. Kwaja is careful to explain that the pietist depiction of faith is a continual expression of one's ongoing conscious commitment to faith, a conversion of life so to speak. She neglects to explore in full, however, the pietist belief that outward actions were a necessary extension of that inward self-conscious conversion. Authentic conversion, in the words of pietist August Hermann Franke, um, was never solely about individual self-identity. Instead, he described it, uh, true Christianity, as always being to God's glory and for his neighbor's good. Um, for the pietist, love of neighbor is a never-ending spiritual labor of reorienting one's responsibility for herself and others as well. Certainly there are echoes of this uh, responsibility to both self and other in Kierkegaard. We could talk about works of love, for example. In the prayer that opens that volume, Kierkegaard writing as himself expresses, in heaven no work can be pleasing unless it is a work of love sincere in self-renunciation, a need in love itself, and for that very reason, without any claim of meritoriousness. The shall of love of neighbor presents an ever-present duty we are incapable of fulfilling, a duty that we simultaneously choose and fail to uphold. This ascetic ideal in Kierkegaard with deep roots in pietism would seem to me to be a place uh, for a fruitful extension of Kawaja's argument. Perhaps she didn't do that um, because of then the potential difficulty of tracing that particular ideal through Heidegger and Sartre. Mm -hmm. And so in the subsequent sections, I demonstrate how we might be able to take that thread um, by thinking of conversion in terms of not just a personal conversion, but conversion as authentic being with others, which I argue we can see on the path through both Buber and Jaspers. Um, my personal uh, flag, boober flag to wave is that I think he's one of our most underappreciated existentialists. Uh, most narratives of existentialism certainly acknowledge him for his fundamental contribution of I it, I thou, uh, but leave him on the margins of the tradition. And although he's mentioned uh, in the existentialist family tree, as Kawaja describes it early on in, in her book, she doesn't explore the ways in which his work might have um, itself be con uh, contributing to existentialism's ongoing conversation with Protestant pietism. In fact, I believe Buber's philosophy may have more in common with the pietist anthem of God's glory and neighbor's good than Kierkegaard, Heidegger, or Sartre. Uh, Kawaja's categories of conversion and asceticism fit well with Buber's view of authenticity, I believe. Um, and for Buber, I'm an uh, authentic self when I choose the mode of being I thou, and by allowing myself to be simultaneously responsible for and called into question by the other is thou. That's when I become who I most truly am. 
But I thou is never a permanent achievable state. The meeting between I and thou is always present. Um, and I loved this statement um, out of Kawaja's book, the temporal expression of sin is to lack a present tense. And I think that's beautifully mirrored in Buber's famous statement on authenticity, that without it, man cannot live. But he who lives with it alone is not a man. Um, we can see how Buber's work might extend Kwaja's thesis uh, if we focus on the mutuality of authenticity more than the singular focus of personal conversion that we see um, in other existentialists um, who think of conversion more as an individualizing labor. But for Buber, authenticity is only ever possible in the context of mutuality um, with the other as thou, regardless of whether that other is uh, part of the natural world, a fellow human being, or eternal thou. Conversion is a two-sided process. Buber's language for the choice on my part is in my turning uh, with openness towards uh, the other to receive her as thou, but he emphasizes again and again that I must be met by the other through grace. The authenticity of I thou is never personal. The, um, rather, Buber really focuses, um, I think what often gets lost in notions of Buber is the importance of the hyphen between I and thou, um, because it's in that space of betweenness, in that space of we, that an encounter happens. Um, as Buber describes, something happens to man in that moment, in that present, man receives and what he receives is not a content, but a presence, a presence of strength. And that presence of strength for Buber then goes on to connect to the spiritual labor of authenticity uh, because it does not end once I've returned back to the world of it. Rather, the labor of authenticity uh, continues through living out my responsibility to bear witness um, to the world. We could certainly then trace how that concept of bearing witness to the world manifests in practical ways in Buber's own uh, philosophy of education, his political work both in post-World War II Germany as well as in uh, Israel and Palestine. Um, let me be sure to quickly bring Jaspers into the conversation since we are at the Jaspers Society meeting. Um, it seems plausible to me that we would trace these themes through Jaspers as well. I see a lot of hope for doing that through his notion of existential communication in the form of loving struggle. Um, already, um, it, we can see for Jaspers that authenticity involves a taking of responsibility um, for the other and a responsibility to the, allow the other to call me into question. Um, one of my favorite Jasper's quotes is, is um, in uh, volume two of philosophy. He says, I achieve the authenticity of being in the world of men in which even those who cannot understand each other yet respect each other. And in this world, one task remains to come closer and closer to each other in an ever widening perimeter of co communication. And the paradox of Jasper's core belief in the perennial nature of truth and a never-ending commitment to the unattainable goal of human unity, um, I think is consistent with an ascetic view of authenticity. Um, we could talk more certainly about Buber, we could talk more certainly about existential communication as loving struggle, but I wanted to throw this out as other paths we might trace. Thank you. Thank you so much for those uh, uh, comments. I, I, you know, uh, have to start by just saying I am not a, a Buber expert nor a Jaspers expert, though I, I enjoy and have uh, read uh, enough of both to be really excited and encouraged by the proposals that you're um, that you're uh, that you're laying forth here. Um, I had a big enough task, I think, in, um, in, in which seemed at many stages impossible to me, truly impossible, to, to on their own terms read as much as possible, at, even though critically, um, uh, Kierkegaard, Heidegger, and Sartre, and to try to name and, and articulate the connections that I was seeing happening between those works. I, um, I think I had uh, an aspiration at one point to explore the thing that you that you mention, um, which is that Buber has this um, fascinating uh, connection to Pietism in his work on Hasidism, mm -hmm. and that's a whole nother project. You know, I mean, I think also because. One of the exciting things about the existential tradition, one of the things I try to point out in the in the in the in the introduction to the work, is that by saying there is something importantly 
uh, Protestant about the formation of this ascetic ideal in, in existentialism. I don't mean to say it's Protestant as opposed to Catholic, Protestant as opposed to Jewish, Protestant as, but as adverbially in a way um, that may modify, restructure, in, be in dialogue with um, ideas, practices, norms that are coming from, and thinkers that are coming from other forms, other kinds of traditions. So it's not impossible to call Sartre a Protestant atheist. It's not impossible to call Heidegger a Protestant Catholic in certain kinds of ways. I admit, for lots of reasons, even though tempted by that connection with Hasidism and Pietism and Buber, I recoil from the project of thinking about how I would try to claim Buber when that has been lo uh, a criticism of him in lots of ways and of that German Jewish uh, tradition in that generation of thinkers that they they were sort of uh, co-opted by a certain kind of German ideological. So I felt nervous about about wading into that into that water. But I, the way that you approach the question of his. Um, uh, of his thinking and and the passage uh, about about the it, which I mean also goes into just, just before that passage, there's there's a, a, a distinction between the present and the past, right? And so mm -hmm. that that really uh, tracks uh, pretty nicely onto the onto the discussion of the present as an ascetic kind of uh, petit objet petit a or w w however you want to call it in in, in existential thinking. Um, and so, but I, 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 I'm excited by that, and also by the, the, the connections you see in Jaspers. The, the questions that I, I think I have that are, um, and, and I'm all for someone taking um, uh, this book simply as an encouragement to think further in connected directions um, uh, in thinking about connections between pietism and, and existentialism. Um, so yes, on that, on that score. Um, the questions that I think that I have go back, one, one at, the, at the conceptual level, going back to, to some of the other threads in the conversation that we've been having so far is, OK, to think about the I, thou, or loving struggle in either of these two thinkers, which are ethical categories in a sense, maybe perhaps not under Kant's definition of ethical, right? But they have, they're largely rest as, as ethical, ethical ideas. To think about those as compatible with asceticism, there's something fascinating to me about that. But I'm, I wonder whether the narrative, as I've designed it, going toward personal authenticity, can really be best suited for that kind of an account. Partly because the notion of ascetic that um, that I'm using, though it isn't about self-denial and is totally compatible with affirmative stances towards existence, Weber is. Uh, so, uh, is is a figure that that has been influential to me in thinking about asceticism. And I talk about him a little bit in the in the first chapter. Um, in thinking about that that second criteria, it's not an intermediate. Um, it's not an the the practice described as ascetic ought not be an intermediate end, right? Or a, a something of use to a larger or, or uh, more holistic task. I wonder what in the context of mutuality, as you put it, means in 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 Buber and in the context of loving struggle means in 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 Jaspers and to what extent the way in which authenticity figures in their thinking in the context of mutuality, whether that would be. Um, better understood as ethical with perhaps a dimension that resembles the first criteria, which is mm -hmm. unending um, uh, uh, labor. But I wonder about the second one um, and whether they wouldn't even actually argue against that. You know? mm -hmm. So that's kind of a, that's kind of, um, a, a, I had a secondary question, but maybe this is too much, uh, just about the way that messianism, it's related the, in, in Buber's thought, plays into the way that you're seeing um, a possible compatibility between ascetic um, authenticity in, in some of these other figures and in Buber's work, because the messianic w would be a teleological kind of orientation, which I think, Instinctively, I think that might change things, but I'm, but I wonder how you how you might how you might um, how you might uh, slice that particular issue, mm -hmm. if I can. When you're writing a paper and you sort of have the you know the question you're afraid of running in the back of your head of like, can I really pull off asceticism in Buber and Yastres? <laughs> and I, I think um, I think I have more hope maybe for it being done in well. <laughs> I was going to say more hope for it being done in, in Buber because he really, kind of in the same way that Sartre walks this line of trying to say, you know, I'm not telling you you should be authentic, authentic, uh, authentic but, right, you know, we, we know there's that underlying but. In Buber, it's the same. I mean, there's no normative judgment about I, it, 
versus I thou. And he argues against making one again and again and again. At the same time, is there an underlying but? Yeah, but if we have that same in Sartre, I would argue it's there in Kierkegaard too. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I kind of think Buber um, really is trying to avoid reducing this to the ethical. Um, Jaspers, um, I think it's interesting because he, as a pluralist, is trying so hard to, um, in, in, in my view, trying so hard to avoid any one particular instantiation of the ethical. That's where I see the possibility for getting him out of that category. Mm -hmm. uh, that might not work. <laughs> so, um, yes, and I did want to say, too, about your comments at the beginning. I, it makes me, there's a Nigerian author, Chimamande Adichie, um, who talks about a Nigerian woman once reading one of her novels and saying, um, here's what your next novel should be, and this is exactly what your characters are going to do. And I, I did want to acknowledge that this would have, like, yeah, the, the, I don't see it as a failure of the book that you didn't do all of these things. So, yeah. I'm very sensitive to the point and was doubting myself at certain moments too in terms of the choice of figures, why Kierkegaard, Heidegger, and Sartre, these are like, you know, the Mount Rushmore of existentialism. <laughs> this is the, the caricature of what existentialism is supposed to be. Why not use this moment in thinking about the tradition to bring marginalized voices, whether you're talking about Buber, whether you're talking about Fanon, with, and I had, there was a big part of me that wanted to do that. Um, the reason, I think, the substantive reason, other than my own fears in certain moments, the substantive reason why I ultimately, I think, tried uh, to, 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 to keep that focus was because, as I, as I put it in the beginning, you know, the re if overarching, it was this bicameral model that really, uh, of, of religious aesthetic, um, uh, existentialism over here and atheistic or secular mm -hmm. philosophical mm -hmm. and weirdly those are three synonyms in some interpretations of existentialism that over on the other side and that being the case it was really Heidegger and Sartre perhaps Camus also but because of his relationship to uh, uh, um, um, authenticity as, as part fan part not uh, didn't feature them so because those are the kinds of uh, uh, figures who um, uh, who seem to give the greatest um, uh, fodder for those who would want to defend the distinction between religious and, uh, uh, and, and secular or atheistic existentialism. Buber and Jaspers, I think, give you already more complicated cases. Like, it's reading Buber and Jaspers together uh, with Heidegger that start feels anxious and wants to mm -hmm. create these distinctions and these barriers to make up, uh, to, to understand the tradition. And, it's it's those kinds of thinkers who I think you know gave uh, what I would what I call in the beginning the feel of religion to existentialism its most uh, its most its its sort of strongest jolt. But so so it was it was the pr if there's a if there's a substantive principle it was on wanting to start with those figure those figures who um, who are seen to be at the center of the atheistic existentialist tradition and trying to unwork that the, the the sort of composition of that impression by by starting with that with with, with that and I think it would have surprised um, even the, perhaps the Protestantism would have surprised people in, in Buber and certainly the remarks that you're making about possibly thinking about the ethical in terms of the ascetic that would have but seeing him in line with the religious uh, uh, figures of existentialism I think that would have been um, less surprising and so so mm -hmm. it was it was on that basis that, that that I made the decision but yeah so actually it's a, it's a story that Marcel tells about Camus so Camus Camus and Marcel were buddies. Um, he, uh, Marcel thought that Camus uh, was the most authentic uh, person of any uh, uh, belief or not belief that he had ever met. Um, and he uh, thought that he was virtuous beyond most theists uh, because of, of his authenticity. Mm -hmm. And when uh, Marcel asked him, you know, why aren't you a theist? Uh, Camus told him, well, for two reasons. One, the suffering of children in the Holocaust and to Protestant materialism. And Camus thought uh, on the continent that the largesse and inauthenticity of the Protest Protestant tradition actually lent itself as an argument against the existence of God and one that he, he could not succumb to. That is the most fascinating sequel to Weber's Protestant yes. ever Yes, yeah. Wow. Oh. That should be in the appendix to the Rutledge, Rutledge edition of the Protestant ethic. Um, so interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 
that I wish I I wish I knew about that. Uh, I wish I, I had known about that quote. It's perfect. Uh, it's a perfect representative of I think that trickiness at the heart of naming the religious in secular thinking in the 20th century. Is it exclusive of the secular? If not, and I think that's what, partly what the curiousness of Marcel's comment, comment, if it's not either secular or religious, if it's not either atheistic or religious, then what are the categories that we could draw on to describe the collaboration, the intimacy, the co-implication of those stances or positions? And um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was in thinking about existentialism as um, as a field of questions and debates that in which something really interesting is happening in, in the history of religion and the relationship between religion and philosophy that 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 that, that comment really uh, sort of exemplifies that that started me thinking about the book but um, uh, but but Protestant materialism okay so I mean Weber's thesis quickly put is that there's something paradoxical about Protestantism because though it seems to be saying in the surface of its texts and its theology, if you interpret it at the level of the word, that um, uh, that there, there's nothing you can do to earn your place uh, in uh, in in as as one of the elect. Um, there's nothing you can do to be saved. So why is it that they work so hard and make so much money? You know, and and he has this crazy but even though we can't access any of the evidence for this sociological theory anymore, it is nonetheless one of the most persistent and influential kind of mm, ways of imagining the relationship between idea and practice in, in, that, in, in the history of um, theory, theories about modern religion. And, and his point was that uh, you know, it, it's, um, it's precisely in not being seen that, um, that there's a sort of anxiety that builds up. And um, uh, while making money can't save you, perhaps making money can be seen as a proof of your having been saved, right? And so Camus putting that, uh, uh, spinning that on the other on the other side is 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 uh, is a is a is a fabulous um, reversal, and it shows in a fa in fact I think something that I I I sensed and tried to gesture at but didn't develop in in the book um, that Camus maybe had as clear a vision as anyone in the tradition of the ascetic structure of willing. Um, and that while it's not, uh, it's not one on one tied to a notion of authenticity in his work because he's, he's critical of that, it's bound up with his thinking about struggle for sure. Mm -hmm. This is a somewhat strange comment, but I'm going to make it anyway. <laughs> so let me wait. I, I've got to get something that I'm going to read here. So related to the concept of asceticism, which is a big part of the background of this book, but I want to read you a little story from the Desert Fathers of early Christianity <laughs> related to asceticism. Abelot came to Abba Joseph and said, Father, according as I am able, I keep my little rule and my little fast, my prayer, meditation, and contemplative silence. And according as I am able, I strive to cleanse my heart of thoughts. Now, what more should I do? The elder rose up in reply and stretched out his hands to heaven, and his fingers became like ten lamps of fire. He said, why not become totally changed into fire? I, I don't know if I can comment on that, but no, it's okay. yeah, thank you for sharing it. Yeah. What I like about the notion of asceticism in your book is, so maybe one classical notion of asceticism that it seems like Noreen wants to um, resist is that to do this project really well, you should stop being human in some essential way, right? Um, this is a good way to sort of protect oneself from disappointment. This is maybe something like Kierkegaard's character, the infinitely resigned person. But what's nice about Noreen's vision is she's, she's sort of redeeming asceticism in a way um, as something that involves being purely human or, or, or more grounded or in touch with finitude in a way that makes Tony nervous sometimes when we talk about blessedness as being this worldly as opposed yeah. to other worldly. But super happy. But, but, exactly. but we can be, yeah. happy, we can be happy as well. And that there's their in fear and trembling, right, is the, the night of faith receives the world back again in some mm -hmm. important way. So I think there's a really interesting and different notion of asceticism being developed in this book, which I really appreciate. But it's not so dry. It's not utterly dry and abstract. And, do you know what I mean? And uh, deprivation. More, it's going towards something more. Yeah. Why not become totally changed into fire? <laughs> uh, 
an issue that you alluded to in your opening comments at the very beginning, which is that if you're going to view asceticism as something that restores the importance of the human and of the importance of human striving, I worry that at least your reading of Kierkegaard and perhaps of some of um, the other existentialists as well, but particularly Kierkegaard, becomes too Pelagian. It looks in the end as though you locate the source of value in life as something that is possible for we human beings to attain under our own powers. It's not Pelagian in the traditional strict sense of us being able to make ourselves perfect and so earn our way to heaven, but it is Pelagian in kind of the, the more liberal, or kind of the more expanded sense of making it possible for us to acquire religious value on our own. And that's something that I read Kierkegaard as pretty dead set against. Yeah, so I, I guess I want to know like if, if you're going to kind of like embrace Ryan's view, like yeah, I'm worried that you're going to skewer yourself on the horn of the objection that I want to push. And you're nodding, but your point is that we choose to sin. Um, yes, but I also agree with that one, I think. Okay, okay, well, <laughs> complex sets of accord and disaccord. <laughs> Where are we but in reading here, who are? Um, okay, so, yeah. That's a part, yeah, you, you didn't go into that in your remarks, but I was thinking about that because it was in your printed, uh, in, your, in your written uh, critique about the Pelagianism. So, a couple of thoughts about that. Um, on the one hand, yes, I want to see, uh, strangely enough, for someone who thinks about, uh, you know, uh, perhaps Nietzsche's position on asceticism and affirmation as distinct kinds of threads in um, spiritual and, and philosophical history, um, that, that affirmation can be understood, an affirmative stance to life can be understood as having an ascetic structure insofar as what I, uh, if what affirmation means is the given, the matter that I'm affirming, whatever it might be, gets its value through that consent, through that choice. So it's, and I think that there are large elements of Kierkegaard's authorship which, um, which are devoted to not just, not just sort of staking himself on the side of that position, but actually kind of inventing the terms around which one might think about choice as having that kind of a value. So, um, so I, I, I do think that Kierkegaard's thinking about choice is legible in those terms, and that's what I'm trying to argue. On the question of whether that implicates me in Pelagianism with respect to Kierkegaard, I would say no. Why? Because I'm not saying that, again, it's a, does Kierkegaard amount to a thinker in which this structure represents him and controls the rest of the way his authorship should be read? I'm not saying that. I'm, I, I, perhaps for someone with that concern, I ought to have made an explicit statement about that in, in, in that chapter. But I don't make the statement to the contrary that one should never have, uh, 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 one should not think that way about Kierkegaard uh, uh, if it, uh, in, in asking questions about, um, uh, in asking questions about human powers. And I have a long reading about how, um, how the willing at the heart of despair fails, and it's that crisis. It's not the will itself. It's that crisis which discloses a possibility outside the willing itself for Kierkegaard, which is not, uh, which is not freedom, and it's not the act, and it's not a part of the ascetic structure. It's that moment of grace, which, um, which is the kind of end point or the culmination of that striving. So I don't, um, I don't, I don't, I don't claim that it's, it's the work that um, will save you in Kierkegaard, but he will say many, many, many times about himself that work, the only the one in the realm of the spirit, only the one who works gets the bread, right? And he uses economic metaphors left and right to talk about. It. When I started uh, summarizing it and thinking about values, am I, am I, am I, am I exaggerating? Am I uh, pushing him into a, a language or an idiom that's alien to him in thinking about this really in terms of value and a valorization of labor? And does that make him like the the connections I saw with even Marx kind of coming out of that moment, appropriation and value and labor, and thinking about that coming out of Hegel, a kind of connection between them opened up. But is that is that a and not when I saw the degree to which those economic metaphors really structure his, way, his ways of thinking about labor. However, like, I, I don't mind that, uh, that if you want to make a, 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 an interpretation of Kierkegaard's pathway to faith, which is when Pelagianism becomes a problem. It doesn't become a problem when you're asking what, what are the materials in his authorship that, co that constitute a thinking about choice 
that becomes influential. And so I wouldn't dispute your, I think it comes from a different question. Um, and I don't think that the chapter or what I'm saying now um, should be taken as a claim that Kierkegaard thinks that we get saved by our labor. It means that labor has value creation in the way that he orients it. It's not that it, you get saved by doing it. So it's, it's about that difference. All of those examples of what choice means, right? It's not choosing this or that, it's choosing to choose. And it's in choosing to choose choice or but now I'm choice worried. or repentance. Now choice now or repentance. Choice worried. or repentance. But now I'm worried we're back in the debate. I'm now I'm worried that we're back in the debate that we had an hour and a half ago. Is so long as you insist on the importance of these economic metaphors and talk um, in fear and trembling about how only the one who works eats, uh, gets bread, now it looks like you're instrumentalizing the labor. The labor is done for the sake of this e economic payoff or for the sake of the bread. But that's a direct quote from Husserl. That's not me. Right, but then he's not aesthetic in this second sense of valuing labor just for its own sake and not as a means to some further end. Oh, so what value, but that's, but that's the structure of value, right? So what does value mean for its own sake? I mean, how can one value something for its own sake? Value is about a kind of translation where you have to have an as. You have to have an as in order for value to be legible. I can't take something as valuable without taking it as something. And insofar as I take it as something, I can't simply take it as itself unless that taking as is all we mean by So in order for something to have value, there has to be some element of difference involved in the very like ascription of value itself. And what, if you think of value as itself external to labor, like if you think of value as external to the thing, as it, like itself, right? Then, we're in a, then we can't even get started on the discussion, right? But insofar as describing as valuable labor He's using those metaphors. I treat them as metaphors, but they're, it's interesting that they're economic and the way that they, they, the way that they coordinate with economic thinking. I'm not saying that, um, uh, that, that Kierkegaard literally thinks that there's bread at the end of this labor. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you all. all Thank you. Okay, okay. So, okay, so here's my problem. So,